Happy Wednesday and welcome to part two of our UCTV community discussion. I'm going to be your host once again today, John Buckley. I'm your UC Vice President, and I want to welcome everyone that's joined us back for another great day of discussion. So just so you know, we do miss our lovely host, Samantha Latois. She will be back with us on Monday, but we're sending out all of our love, and we can't wait to see you soon. In today's show, I have an amazing, amazing, great cast. Um, we have Kashad Chad from UC and Care Resource. We also have Tremaine. We have Craig Prather, Josefina Blanco, and Nick Harris. Also, um, just to give you an update for our Unity Coalition, uh, we have updated our pages. So if you go to our community resources, you can now find information for bail for protesters. Um, we have things you can do right now for racial justice, um, food pantries and COVID-19 info, as well as open and affirming faith centers. And then also, don't forget, we have part three of our community dis discussion coming up on Friday. We'll have Ariah Lester joining us as well as Paul Thomas. For today's discussion, um, we're gonna go ahead and start with two of our guests shortly after. Also, let me just give you an update. As far as the news, currently, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison is increasing charges against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin to second degree murder in George Floyd's killing and also charging the other three officers involved in the incident. Police opened fire on an LGBTQ bar, Ruby Deluxe in Raleigh, North Carolina, after they received an anonymous tip that the bar was giving water to protesters. Also in COVID-19 deaths in Florida, have risen to 2,566. In the United States, we're at a total of 108,000. Worldwide, we have 376,000 deaths. Florida coronavirus cases have surged past 58,700. That's the biggest daily gain in six weeks. So that's a very good reminder as we're out there and we're protesting. Please remember COVID is still around. Um, be safe, take precautions, use your mask, bring hand sanitizer, bring gloves. Um, you wanna protest and we want action, but we wanna do it safely and we wanna make sure that we're keeping COVID-19 down. So I wanna welcome to the platform. We have both of our first guests today. I have Nick Harris as well as Josie Blanco. Welcome. Hi. And welcome, Josie. Are you able to hear me? Hello. <laughs> I, I am you. not seeing our moderator. Uh, um, I'm not either. <laughs> but I, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Well, I can see you and hear you, so I'm doubly blessed. <laughs> all right. So welcome. Either way, um, Nick, if you want to go ahead, just give us a brief introduction of yourself and tell us a little bit more about what you do. Hi, everybody. John, are you able to see me? I can. Okay. I'm not sure why I cannot see everybody, but I'll keep going. Um, so my name is Nick Harris. I proudly serve as Commissioner Nikki Freed's LGBTQ consumer advocate for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Commissioner Freed is a member of cabinet, and this is the first time we have an LGBTQ uh, position to a member of cabinet in the state of Florida. It's also the first time we've had a member of cabinet uh, extend protections to our community, to their employees, over 3,000 employees. Commissioner Freed included sexual orientation, gender identity to our non-discrimination policy. So I proudly do that work I also sit on the board of HRC and other organizations, but I'm thankful to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick. And Josie, can you hear me?
And Josie, please go ahead and give us an introduction and tell us a little bit about your background. So she might be having a little technical difficulty. Um, that's okay. This is live. You know, those things happen. I believe that um, this is the appropriate time. Oops. I think. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Josie Blanco. I'm a neuropsychologist um, with 17 years of private practice experience and uh, more than 20 years of experience working with the LGBTQ community. I also was a member of the Aqua Foundation Board for six years. Um, it is my privilege to be here to speak about this very important matter. Um, and I really look forward to the discussion. Um, first of all, I want to say that uh, I just want to extend my heartfelt condolences to uh, Mr. Floyd's family, um, to his friends, to his community. Uh, this is a great time of sadness for all of us, and it is a time of loss for all of us. But I hope that it's also going to be a time of renewal for all of us as well. Um, so with that said, uh, let's start the exchange, I guess. Thank you, Josie. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to start... Nick, I know you were at the okay. uh, protest. Now, I'm not hearing our moderator right now. She, she can't hear me? All right, hold on. I hear you okay. You hear me okay? I hear you fine. I know you were at the protest on Saturday um, that took place in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, describe your experience and, and what that was like. I wish we had not had to be there for the reason that we were. Um, what I will say is it was beautiful to see so many people come together around uh, a common cause, the fact that there was so much diversity. And I was actually a little bit surprised because the entire time we were there, it was a very peaceful protest. Um, when we left, there were no issues. And so I was a little bit surprised when I got home and saw more of the unrest. But I, I also understand that people are People are angry, okay. people are hurting, people are upset, but it was, uh, I'm glad I was there. I'm glad I was part of that to make sure that people know this is where I stand and I think we have to take action and do more and, and call on our government uh, to create this change and we have to demand it if they won't give it to us. Of course, of course, um, that is, that hits the nail on the head. Um, it's very interesting also that the Department of Justice uh, sent a riot team to DC as well as Miami that are highly trained te uh, technical units to, that are used to responding to prison disturbances. Um, and the cities both didn't know about that. What, how, do, how does that translate to you? What do you think about that? I, I'm sitting here because my face should tell it all. Um, what I reminded folks on my timeline and I've talked about just a few weeks ago when COVID was happening, you saw folks with guns on storming capitals, hanging governors in effigy from trees and everything else. It, what's interesting to me is that it seems as though when black folks take to the streets when black folks protest, mm -hmm. when we care about and value our lives and demand change, we see the difference in the response. And so I put up actually side by side, President Trump's tweets where he was saying, you know, uh, liberate Minnesota and, and all of these things. And then when people begin to do it, and mm -hmm. this time not over, uh, not being able to go to a restaurant or get a haircut, but over people's lives, we saw a difference in response. And so I want to be clear, voting is only one way that you can demonstrate your advocacy. There are many different ways, whether that is a protest, whether it's in the work that you do. But it is important that we send a message of what is and is not acceptable to us. And so one of the ways I will make my voice heard is come November when I vote him out of office. Very well. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Josie, I was just asking, I don't know if you heard or were, was able to hear, but I was asking Nick what she thought about the Department of Justice sending in um, US tact technical teams that are used to dealing with um, 
prison outbreaks or like prison disturbances to DC and Miami. I think her audio still might be high. Yeah, I think she's still having some trouble and maybe I, I I will go ahead. Oh, there I'm we go. so yeah, I'm so sorry. I go. cannot hear the moderator. Um, so I really apologize for that. Nick, I can hear you perfectly. So he asked the same question of you, the fact that we had tactical units sent into D.C. and other cities without those mayors or knowing that this was going in. And so why would we treat people that way? What are your thoughts on the fact that, you know, we don't normally see that response in our cities? How do you feel about that? Um, well, the way that I feel about that is that it was a political statement and it was bait for his base, for our president's base. I hate to say that, but it's true. Um, and also the fact that, you know, black lives aren't valued the same way that white lives are valued. Um, you know, this was obviously a cause that is not important to our president. Um, and I think that he is, no pun intended, making a tactical mistake. Uh, in terms of the fact that he is just feeding his base at the expense of the rest of the U.S. population, let's say. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, what is going to happen is that I think he's going to be voted out of office in November. And um, I, too, will be casting my vote. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. That That is the main way we can all make a difference, which... I can't put a more importance on the fact of registering and making sure that you're registered to vote. Um, you know who's on the ballot. And you, if you don't, you, there's many ways to get familiar. Um, you can definitely start with your local um, politicians, your local candidates, um, as well as those House representatives, all the way up to the presidency. Um, Nick, I know you're familiar with that. How can we help our voters that aren't registered out there um, get registered? How can we help our voters register? So I'm repeating that question just so uh, my fellow panelists can hear that as well. Um, there, are, there, First of all, you can log in, and I, I know that I'm located in Broward County, but number one, you should be logging into your uh, Supervisor of Elections website to see if you're registered to see if your registration is valid and up to date, to make sure you verify your signature, whether or not you need to update your signature. What I try to tell people, and we need to be real, we live in Florida and voter suppression is real. And so we need to be proactive in doing everything we need to do. I think folks are doing a good job out there trying to register folks. I know the Florida Democratic Party has registered more people and is actually above uh, outpacing uh, Republican Party, no matter what side you're on, registering all people to vote is good. But what I say to people is I also want you to make sure you're registered to vote by mail because we don't know what the conditions are going to be come November or September. And COVID is still here and we don't have a vaccine and we do not have an effective treatment. And so you have to be ready to still catch your vote. That's why he keeps punching and, and hitting vote by mail because they don't want you to vote. So it's important that we prepare for that so we don't have surprises come November. Awesome. Josie, did you want to add to that? Josie, do you want to add to that? Well, the only thing that I would like to add to that is the fact that it is very important for community agencies to work together. Um, you've already mentioned uh, one and other agencies like, you know, uh, Equality Florida, the Aqua Foundation for Women. Um, it's important for all of us to work together to make sure that people are registered to vote. And you're absolutely right, Nick. Um, right now, you need to make sure that you're registered to vote by mail because we do not know what the conditions will be uh, when it is time to cast your ballot. Awesome. Awesome. Agreed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to change the subject slightly because this is something I feel very strong about. As we as people, Black people, people of color, if we're taking a stand on Black Lives Matter, there also becomes a question of how true is that in a sense? Because as well as being black, I'm a gay man. So I have those strikes against me. 
When I walk into the world on a daily basis, not only do I have to deal with the prejudices of being a person of color, being received as black, but I'm, I'm gay and I'm a male. Then we have our transgender community that's often misrepresented and not paid attention to because number one, they don't have those privileges that some of us do have. Um, I feel very strongly about trans black lives we've seen senseless murders of trans black women and, and trans black men. What is your take on, on that, Nick and Josie? Well, here are my thoughts that, thank you for that question, because it's important that we not lose sight of the conversation around number one, George Floyd, that we not lose sight of the conversation around Ahmaud Aubrey, that we not lose sight of any of our black men that we have lost. Of course. Uh, but when we say that, we also have to remember that black lives includes Breonna Taylor. Exactly. You know, sometimes I, I see this struggle in the community on my timeline where we sometimes forget about the women we've lost. I haven't forgotten about Brianna. I haven't forgotten about Sandra Bland. But when we talk about that, like you said, I'm not just black. I'm black first, I'll say that. But I also identify as queer. And so I refuse to leave women behind and I refuse to leave my LGBTQ community behind. I acknowledge all of my intersections. And I wanna say this, black trans lives matter. Yeah. And when we're going to name all of those other people, yeah. I refuse to have a conversation when we're not discussing Nina Pop. Yeah. I refuse to have a conversation where we are not discussing Tony McDade. Yeah. I refuse to have a conversation where we are not discussing Ayana Dior. Yeah. All black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black trans lives matter. Yeah. And so we must make sure that we do not forget our LGBTQ uh, community. But when we say that, we always know sometimes we leave the T behind and we cannot do that. Of course. Um, and it's very vital that this is a platform. So we use it in the sense that now is the time. We've always spoke, but now we have to put into action. And I, I can't walk with everyone and not include everybody. Um, uh, Josie, what, what is your uh, take on that? Josie, uh, he's asking your take on that as well, that we can't leave, forget our intersections and leave folks behind. Cases Hold that on one second. There you go. You were okay. muted. Start over. There you go. Okay. I, I was just mentioning the fact that you're speaking to the chorus that, yes, um, you're absolutely right. And that one of the cases that comes to mind is Tamir Rice. Um, you know, it's not just men and women and, and trans people um, that have been afflicted by this violence. It, it saddens me to think back in 2014 when this 12 year old child was playing with a toy gun and the, the police didn't even stop to ask questions. He was gunned down immediately. Um, and what justice did we get? What, what justice did we see in that case? And, and unfortunately, we didn't see any justice at all. And that's another thing that we forget sometimes, that it's not just men, women. Um, it's also children, children that have been gunned down. Um, so, yes, it's, it's important that we remember everyone, that we remember, remember everyone that has a, been a victim of a corrupt police culture but it's not just if i may I say so sound. the police culture it's it's okay. also the justice system the educational system the economic system mm -hmm. this is systemic and it needs to change absolutely very well i couldn't agree more thank you thank you um also so uh i, I just want to put this quote out there because this is also from one of our other good friends um Nadine, which is Nadine Smith, the uh, Equality Florida Executive Director quoted, uh, Florida is an epicenter of anti-trans violence with seven black transgender women having been brutally murdered over the last two years. 
And often these murders involve misgendering, as they did with the Tampa Police Department and local media. Um, what is your take on that? We know this continues to be an issue. I mean, honestly, John, you just said it. If we are excluding our trans siblings from a, from the conversation around Black lives, then then surely we aren't taking the time to appreciate when we are misgendering people, when we're not accounting for those. But that, but we have to back up and make understand that you have to do real work in those communities, because why is there a disconnect that people can be misgendered? Why do we see such a high murder rate? The fact that the average life expectancy of a black trans woman is 35 years of age. I get tired of saying that until we're ready to tackle things like what do we do to really support uh, our black trans siblings? Are we talking about the conversation why black trans women and black trans men feel uncomfortable to call the police? Why is there always this issue if you know that you're not going to be serviced or served as a community when you make that call? When we're not having conversations around survival sex work? and decriminalization of it. We are not having the real conversation. And so what I say to people is it's great to keep saying their names, but if you're saying their names and you don't take action, you continue to, it's a disservice. Mm -hmm. And so I want to do more than say names, take action, stop using black trans deaths, stop using black bodies to go out and, and, and fundraise and do anything else, show up in these communities and do real work because the consequences of that have been death and we can no longer take that. We must demand better. Awesome, Amen. awesome, thank you. Um, can Josie, you wanna see if Josie? Yes, Josie, do you have anything to add to that about the issues we see around trans violence and the responses and, and whether or not we're really paying attention to uh, the Black women specifically that have been losing their lives at a higher rate, but also not forgetting Black men, of course. Yeah. trans men. The, the one thing I just would like to add is that when one of us is left behind, we're all left behind. When one of us suffers injustice, when one of us is oppressed, when one of us is pained, we're all oppressed. We're all pained. We have to remember that. It needs to be a, I think the important to say is that there needs to be a discussion on inclusiveness. And also I would say to our white, you know, sisters and brothers, we need to have uncomfortable conversations about all of this, about race, about ethnicity, about sexual orientation, uh, orientation uh, gender identification. We need to start educating our children when they are young. Um, I would say start talking to them. I know it's uncomfortable, but right around the age of six, hey, they're starting to understand. They're starting to see the the in equality. And it's a good time to start talking and having these difficult conversation because racism is a learned behavior. And yeah. if we start educating early, then we start changing our culture. And that is markedly important to do. So once again, we need to educate and we need to be inclusive. And that would be my two cents there. Awesome. Thank you. John, I, I I hate to jump in. I have got to go. I appreciate you all having me. This is such an important conversation. And if I could just echo, you were so on point with that answer. The work has to be done. That work cannot be led by black people and brown people. It has to be led by white people who are prepared to talk about privilege, talk about systemic racism. And we're hoping they're ready to do that work. They have to be helping to lead this change. I thank you all for having me. Thank you so much, Nick. It was, it's been more than a pleasure and we look forward to having this conversation again because we're not only gonna continue to have these conversations, but we're gonna put hand in action towards moving forward. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so also moving on with, remember we do have part three of this discussion coming up. Um, it's gonna be on Friday. 4 p.m. right here on our Facebook Live. We have Araya Lester, who is the Transgender Strategy uh, Center, and Paul Thomas from A Health and Community Activist. 
they will be continuing this dedicated community conversation uh, for part three on Friday. So please, if you're tuning in, um, share this conversation, share this live. Um, we welcome your questions. We welcome your comments. Um, we're here for you. We're all in this together and we're all about conversation, action, and positivity. Let me introduce our next guest as I see Tremaine Jones. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing as best as I can. Um, you know, we're all, that's a tricky question nowadays. So, um, but thank you for joining us. And then I'm also seeing Mr. Craig Prasser. How are you? He might be a little muted. Craig? Yeah, I think he's having some issues with his audio. <laughs> no worries. We'll, we'll try that again. Um, in the meantime, Tremaine, go ahead and give us a brief introduction and tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you're involved with. Yeah, so my name is Tremaine Jones. I also go by Trey. Um, my pronouns are he, him, them, they. I am the project director at the Freedom Fund, and the Freedom Fund is a nonprofit organization that secures the safety and liberty of low-income people in jails and immigration detention with a focus on LGBTQ people. And our work is, um, is based in Fort Lauderdale, so Broward County. However, we do um, mostly criminal um, bills in South Florida, and we do a lot of immigration bills throughout the country. Um, outside of that, we provide a lot of post-release support. So as people are getting out of jails, we provide um, support services such as case management. We provide court advocacy. Um, we do um, monthly meetings, um, which are called participatory defense, where it's really talking about as a person is going through trial, how can they advocate for themselves to make sure that they um, their case is um, more sound compared to if they're just they're, they just don't know what's happening within the criminal legal system. We also provide free HIV testing. Um, and we also do um, workshops and community education series around um, mass incarceration and how it impacts different communities. And I also just want to, um, I know y'all talked a little bit about, um, quite a bit about this earlier, um, but I just want to just give my condolences and send um, a lot of um, power um, to the families and to the people who have gotten killed recently. Um, Tony McDade, Floyd, Rihanna Keller, um, Ahmaud Arbery, and also um, just want to highlight um, the killing of Nina Pop that happened in Missouri, and also Ayanna Dior who got attacked in Minnesota, the same um, the same city that um, George Floyd got killed in, and he was attacked by men. Um, so I just wanted to just bring that into your face as we begin this conversation. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I see you, Mr. Crawford. How are you, Craig? Hey, I'm good. How are you both? We're doing, doing as best as we can. Yeah, we got to hang in there. We got to hang there and be strong for our community. But um, I just want to... I just want to say that I really appreciate you all doing this and having these talks and and putting out into the community uh, what needs to be done and things like that. Of course, these are conversations that we're going to continue to have. Um, I, I had Tremaine give us an introduction and let us know about the amazing things he's doing within the community. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, go ahead and give us an introduction about yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost you a little bit. What did you say? I had a comment earlier who went in, went ahead and gave us an introduction and let us know about what he does within the community. Um, and likewise, I'm gonna go ahead and give you that opportunity to let us know more about what you do within our community. Okay, uh, what I do in the community, I work for Pride Lines. I am a development coordinator over there. Uh, so I do much, very much a lot of development, a lot of marketing. Um, and a lot of just developing pride lines within the community and as, and, and making our black and brown uh, homeless youth, uh, providing them with better programs and services and, and things that they can utilize uh, within the community to make themselves better. 
Um, so that's really what I do out here in the community. And as well as recently just um, starting to educate myself more on different social justice uh, laws, um, um, acts and things that have happened in the past because I really want to uh, somewhat get into um, assisting our community as far as social justice programs as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, I see you took part in our Miami rally that was on Saturday. Yeah. Um, I saw images of you. I saw images of you and your partner as well. Um, that, that was very liberating. Tell me, tell me about your experience with that. Wow. Well, that experience, um, that was my first protest, my first rally I've ever been to. Uh, being here in Florida and being from up north, um, I've always wanted to somewhat participate in a political protest, uh, but I just didn't, I wasn't of age um, or I just didn't have the time to. So this past weekend, um, I was able to do that. And that experience was, that, that experience was amazing. Um, it was, it was in a way very touching. Uh, it was in a way heartbreaking. Um, it was in a way, um, Feed, fed my mind with a lot of different views and um, different things that I didn't know before, as well as mentally um, stressful to be out there and things like that. Uh, but it was, it was an experience, you know, it was very peaceful. Um, most people out there were very peaceful. They want um, a change in the system. They want to change with uh, with black men and black women and trans uh, black individuals um, with their lives. So I got to see the peaceful part of it, um, which I, on the news doesn't really show that. Um, but we were just happy to, to be out there and to fight for something that is going on and it needs to stop, something that is personal um, and something that just, like I said, it just needs to change. It just needs to change. Awesome, and thank you for standing up and, and taking part in, in that rally. That It was truly awesome, and it's great to know that, you know, it's not always painted as what it what we see. Um, you know, we often get the news who does a good job at reporting some things, but then other things, they make it into a negative light. Right, right, and that's, and that's what I really wanted to let people know that they're, everybody who is protesting they're not violent they're not trying mm -hmm. to loot stores they're not any not any of that it was i went to another protest i it was on sunday i went to another protest and it was so powerful to sit there and see that there was a small group of individuals who wanted mm -hmm. to attack or or just antagonize the police um trying to be in their faces but there was a whole nother huge group of people who were trying to stop them who were trying to talk to them um, it got to the point where they were all holding hands, trying to block the, the antagonizers um, from the police who was bringing a, um, a, um, a different vibe to the whole protest that had already started, um, the vibe with the protest that had already started. So it was very powerful to see all the peaceful protesters come together and stop the negative ne negativity, the looting, or just the violence in general. Um, I saw that at least two or three different times. Um, I know the last on Sunday, um, I believe they started to loot. They did. They started trying to loot and break into the CVS store um, right. on Biscayne Boulevard um, as we came back um, um, from that march that day. And there was literally people holding hands um, in front of the, the ride, the looters who were throwing rocks at the window. The, uh, the peaceful protests were holding hands. They were getting hit. Um, they were taking blows, but they were just trying to send the message that, hey, this is not what we're here for. You are letting us, um, you are, you are, you're souring the, the message that we're trying to, to, exactly. to let the uh, community know about, society know about. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Tremaine, welcome back. Are you, are you, can you hear me? All right. So you were also at the rallies as well. Um, Craig just gave us an amazing experience tell me about yours so can you can you hear me yes all right so um well like when all this was happening um i just remember like just feeling really upset and angry and just you know me thinking about 
you know, when am I going to be next? When am I, I'm going to be, you know, another hashtag for people to, you know, um, to put on social media. And it also made me just think about like, you know, my godson, my godson just turned seven years old. And at some point I may, I may need to have this conversation with him. So just seeing the deaths that happened over the last two, two months, um, of black people being slaughtered in the streets because it, it, it made me furious. Um, and so, um, Sunday, Sunday um, that morning, um, I actually went to the protest in Fort Lauderdale. And I remember us that morning, um, me and a few friends of mine that I went to the protest with, we were just trying to figure out um, what was our action plan as we were getting ready to go to this protest. And I remember right before that happened on my social media, um, someone um, had posted a, um, someone had shared with me a Facebook post of someone that I knew um, who was pretty much calling the protesters chimpanzees. And I was furious. I, you know, like I knew this person for, for a while. And for me, it was just like, you know, it, it just had me understand that, you know, we, we all talk about community and solidarity, but how does that really look like when someone who says they're about the people and for the people are calling people um, who are doing peaceful protests um, chimpanzees, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about the history of Black people being compared to animals, to me, that was really problematic. And so it, it was like, I was already upset and I, you know, I was full of like, um, just rage, but that just ignited any more. Um, it ignited even more. So when I when I went to the protests, um, one of the things I will say, and it is is crazy how the media is portraying um, a lot of these protests is showing that we are thugs, that we are doing so so many bad things when really we're just we're following our constitutional rights, right? And our and, and you know and the. Um, in our First Amendment, right? Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, you know, seeing what was happening on the news and actually seeing it live where people were were peaceful, there were, um, and I just want to give a big shout out to Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter, Alliance Broward and um, Dream Defenders because they were um, one of the few, um, one of the several organizations that put together the protests in Fort Lauderdale. And one of the things I will say about that protest is that they, one, they were really organized. They made sure that there were people out there to help um, folks who had, um, who like passed out, you know, because it was really hot on that day. Um, they also made sure to check in with people to make sure they stay on the right side. So one thing that media fails to um, broadcast is that uh, there are people who have been organizing for a really long time to put this stuff together and they want to make sure that they're prioritizing people's safety and making sure that people are um making sure that people are just um are focused on what's in hand right and so you know we we march from um he, he's in, I, I may be saying the name right but it, it was the parking um fall Fort Lauderdale off of um, Andrews all the way to the Fort Lauderdale police station. And then we, we went back and I have to say like, there was no issues. Like it was, a we wanted to show that we were here and that we're fed up. Um, but yeah. based on what the media portrays, it's like we're being thugs and all these other things. When you see, you know, other protests, like there were protesters when COVID, you know, um, earlier um, a few weeks ago where people were carrying guns, people were threatening the issues. When these protests that are happening, not just here in South Florida, but also across the country are peaceful and we're being called thugs for wanting to um, just highlight and really demand justice for our lives to just purely exist without the harassment. And so um, for me, it was, it it was good to be out and see other people be outraged by what's happening, but it was also very much me thinking of like, okay, you know, there's more things that we need to do as a community to make sure that two to three weeks down the road that this doesn't go ignored, oh, for God. right? You know, that the deaths of, right. you know, all of these people don't go ignored. We need to be holding these, um, these officials accountable to making sure that, you know, they press charges, right? You know, um, I think someone mentioned earlier, you know, you know, Brianna, Brianna Taylor, um, who got killed by police, her, her killers 
still haven't been charged with anything, right? And so I think we need to be very intentional moving forward of making sure that we're, we're continuing to hold these people accountable, that we're still um, are looking at ways of not just holding our city officials accountable, uh, accountable but um, people within our, or, our the organizations that we work for or the organizations that we give money to. Yeah. Awesome. I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I see the lovely Samantha Latoire. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me, Samantha? Maybe not. She might be having some technical issues. Um, we were trying to get her to come on because she's um she's in Philadelphia, I believe, with uh, visiting her family, and um she she's also witnessed some of the rallies that they've had up there, and it's not been so safe, and it hasn't been as calm and peaceful as as the rallies that we've had here. Um, I saw the image of the one black male uh female officer from the fort lauderdale um protest she was commending or either um disciplining the other officers because one of them um, a young lady that was kneeling um were, did you were you around when that happened or what did you see that so i wasn't around when that happened but when I got home, I saw it on the news and I was furious because it, it, it's, it's just a perfect reminder of, you know, I've been hearing a lot lately from people um, online or through the news and they, they, they continuously tell us that we need to stop protesting and that we need to be mindful of voting and we, we don't need to ride and all these other things. And one thing I want to remind people, especially people in the LGBT community, is that we will have we would have no civil rights. We will have we wouldn't even have the right to marry if we weren't um, out there rioting and doing all the things that many of our ancestors did in the past, right? And so when we're talking about the Stonewall Rising, or when we're talking about the LGBT movement, those movements didn't happen because of peaceful, just because of peaceful protest. It was people literally saying, I am tired of being harassed. I am tired of being assaulted and I am tired of being treated as a second class citizen. So I want to make sure I am fighting for what I need to. And there was civil unrest for, for days and weeks at a time while this was happening. Um, and this was being led by a black trans woman and the first fist was being thrown by a black lesbian woman, right? And so when we're talking about, you know, situations like that where we, we need to be more mindful to have peaceful protests and we need, we need to be mindful of how we show up in spaces. As you saw with that young woman that got attacked, she was peacefully protesting and she still got attacked by police officers. So what does that say? So when we're, when we're again, when we're comparing, um, when we're comparing um, protests, or really, when we're comparing riots that happened um, because people were tired of COVID-19 and wanted to go outside with their guns and was, was rioting, you know, there was no issue. Police officers weren't attacking people. Police officers didn't seem concerned about, you know, people coming out with their guns. But when people are coming out and saying, I'm tired of being attacked, I'm tired of being scared, and I'm tired of being concerned if I'm going to become another hashtag, and are still thinking, are, and are still getting attacked, and we have to see that as a problem systemically of how we're treating Black people and how we're treating other people of color. And there's, there's this, you know, there's this um, unfair advantage that um, is granted by people who are white, right? That yeah. we can't afford to have if we're people of color, right? And so for, for me, it's, you know, there, there are people who, you know, think, well, maybe we should go out with guns, but maybe we should, you know, do all of the things that people were doing, you know, in all these different cities to protest COVID. But we also have to think about that if they're killing us and if they're attacking us when we're taking a nil, just imagine what can happen if we're out there with guns too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it goes to people are tired. People are tired and this has not been something that just happened over the last 10 years. This has been happening for decades where unarmed black 
people have been killed, you know, by people who are supposed to protect and serve us, right? And so I, I would just really, um, for me, I just want to um, just give a reminder to everybody who feels a certain way because there are riots that are happening across the country to remember that we will not have any type of human rights or um, any opportunity to marry or do all of the things that has passed through legislation if it wasn't through protests, if it wasn't for riots. So I just want to remind people of that. Like peace, you know, um, change does not just happen through peace. It definitely does happen through a lot of stuff that we're seeing today. And because we have these certain rights, we need to remember that and not forget it. Of course, of course. Let me ask you as well. Um, for both Craig and Tremaine, it's it's. I think it's I welcome. I'm gonna hop on to it. I mean, Hi. Good hey. afternoon, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Um, can you all hear me? What are what are? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How is it going? It's uh -huh. going good. It's going good. I just wanted to hop on uh, a little bit of what Tremaine said. Um, it has. This is a a deeper issue. This is a systematic issue that has been oppressing um, African Americans and really African Americans uh, for many years. And between the police brutality, the racism, it's just been going on too long. And I think that the only difference today is that we have, why there's such uprising today really, is that we have social media, we have camera phones, um, and if videos didn't go didn't go viral, then we wouldn't have anything else to talk about other than coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, I did see somebody. Oh, I seen um, an All Lives Matter thing come up. Um, in my response Exhausting. to that, I would say um, saying that um, that. Oh, saying that exhausting. all lives matter um, in response to Black Lives Matter is kind of like saying the fire part, the fire department should spray down all houses in the neighborhood, even though only one house is on fire, mm -hmm. because all houses matter. Yes, all houses matter, but your house isn't on fire, mm -hmm. and I think some people nearly need to understand that Black um, all lives cannot matter. Um, until Black Lives Matter. And as of now, right now, for many years, for 400 years, Black Lives hasn't mattered um, in our system, in our society, uh, within the police force. Um, enough is enough. You know, we, um, America, America's had, America has had 100 years to dismantle this racist system. We have begged, we have pleaded, we have asked nicely, we have, and people have continued to ignore us. Colin Kaepernick, kneel down um, on the football field, I guess, last year, and people condemned him for peacefully kneeling for the same thing we're fighting for today. And so people do not understand why, why there's rioting, um, why there's looting. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I understand it, but I'm, I'm not here for it, but I understand it. There we go. I'm not here for it, but I understand it. Um, Cause now, it's like people are being ignored and now we've chosen to, black people have chosen to take a page out of, 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 of a white, white America's history books and revolt. Because yeah, right. didn't America begin with the revolution? That's the only difference now. So uh, when, when, when people come up with that, you know, you just keep in mind that this is something that is deeper than just um, 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 black people um, being killed on the streets by the police for it. This goes into the system. This goes into years of oppression, and we are tired. And enough is enough. Yeah, it, it's, this is the result of, of waiting and not having policies that conquer and take out inequality and racial uh, bias. People can understand a white kid shooting up a school because he's been bullied for four months. Mm -hmm. but don't understand why a oppressed group of people are compelled to burn a city down or burn things down after 400 years right. of oppression and issues. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 the, it's, it's hard to hear, but it's the truth. It's, it's the truth, and, it, it, and it's going to be heard, and they're seeing it more than ever. So um, with that being said, Kashai, welcome. I'm happy to be here. I just want to say... I love every single one of you, and you know that. Um, I am happy to be 
on UCTV. Also, um, happy to be on here with Craig and Trey, who I saw this past weekend at the protests in Fort Lauderdale and Miami. Um, for those of us who aren't as familiar with you as we are, give us just a little bit more about your background and all the things that you do in the community. Okay, so Kishai is my name, and I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I was raised here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, for the past six years, I have worked as a health promotion educator and peer navigator in Care Resource. And um, prior to that, over the last 10 years or so, I've volunteered, interned, and worked with numerous LGBT organizations here in South Florida. I'm an individual who believes in equality for all people. Yeah, and yeah. in the work that I do, I believe that it is social justice because there's about 300,000 uninsured people that are uninsured in uh, Broward County. They don't have medical insurance. They don't have health insurance. And part of that is making sure the community is healthy. So social justice and social work is in what I do. And um, whether it be ethnic groups or sexual orientation or gender expression, I do believe that every individual deserves a fair chance at a good quality of life. And that is the driving force of the work that I do. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you. Um, you were also at the, um, the protest. Um, yes. A little bit of your recollection of that, um, because I've also had Tremaine and Craig share their experience. How was that for you? So I am no stranger to protests. Um, this was not my first and it won't be my last. Um, so on Saturday in Miami, I was there from around three o'clock until nine o'clock. And Craig was correct in what he shared. Um, the first the first half or so of my day, it was very peaceful. It was beautiful because the amount of diversity, the amount of different ethnic groups and the passion, the, the, the good intensity of walking around the city and seeing that everyone is unified and has one goal and it's to bring attention to an issue that deserves attention and deserves the amount of like the, I feel like the attention it's getting is justified. I think that for too long, this issue has been swept under the rug. I loved being on I-95 and contrary to popular belief, the people who were in the cars were very happy to honk their horns and they were, they were, you know, waving at us and they were cheering us on. And um, unfortunately, after the protest ended, that's when things took a turn for the worst. Um, there were definitely people who were not there the whole day who had a different temperament and a different agenda. And that was difficult because there was antagonizing um, between a small group of people and the police. And I unfortunately got caught up in some tear gas and I was very afraid. You know, I, I was leaving as I saw that people looted Bayside and I saw people getting tased by the police mm -hmm. and I was, I was afraid, you know, I was trying to get my friend to his car that he had no access to. And, um, I, I was telling people to calm down. Like I literally got out of my car and I was telling people to like, stop yelling at the police. And there, there was just a shouting match and it, it was, it was awful. Um, I was so exhausted, but I decided still to go with Trey um, to Fort Lauderdale on Sunday. And I, we left early just because of my experience the, the day before it, it, it left me sh in shock. And it was just really, it was a lot. It's a lot. This is a very emotional issue. It's a very tense issue. And it, it, it brings a lot of different emotions. Um, so we enjoyed ourselves on Fort Lauder in Fort Lauderdale. We were not there very long, but we came with a purpose. And again, Fort, Fort Lauderdale and Miami, it was the same issue. It was different cities. It was different groups of people, but there was still the same intent to put 
awareness and to put some sort of action and some sort of fire behind the issue that deserves the amount of press coverage that it's getting. Do I agree with all of the press coverage? Absolutely not. There's definitely bias. There's definitely an agenda to paint protesters as villains. But uh, as someone who is a proud protester, um, I know where my heart is. Even though I do condemn stealing and I do condemn violence, I am for people expressing their anger and their pain in the way they have done it because Martin Luther King was a peaceful protester and was assassinated. Gandhi was another peaceful protester and he was assassinated. So the thing is you can do things peacefully or you can do things at a specific set time, but you know, after a time, after at some point, how, how, why should, why should we ask for equality? Like equality is something that is a given right. It should be a given right. It should be a, it should be a human guarantee. We should be guaranteed certain things in life. However, Racism is something that is in every culture. Oppression is something that is in every society. Anti-Blackness is a global thing. It is not exclusive to America. And people are only uncomfortable with the conversation because it's them having a mirror being put up to the reality of how they really feel and beliefs that they were taught okay. through society and through their environment. Okay. Um, and I feel like for a change that everything happening is actually going to break through the surface and we can have these conversations. And I think that this Black Lives Matter movement is going to benefit a lot of other movements and it will break a lot of other discriminations because had it not been for African-Americans fighting for civil rights, I truly don't think the Stonewall movement would happen. And if had it not been for African Americans fighting for their rights, I truly feel like my parents would not have been able to migrate here as well as my family and be successful and flourish. So we owe a lot of work. We owe a lot of thanks um, to the African American community. And, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those people who came before us with the civil rights movement. And I, I am committed to doing as much work as I can for all of the causes that are dear to my heart. And um, I'm just, I'm really proud of this generation because I honestly was losing hope. I was losing hope that through Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram, that folks are just going to be on their phone like, oh, discrimination's wrong. And then th th their job is over. But like people really have been affected by this um, personally or indirectly, and people are taking action. Not everyone's gonna be on the same page, but that's why it's important for us to start to normalize other ways of protesting. Like everyone at that rally and everyone at every protest better be registered to vote. And they need to start not just voting for the presidential candidate, but their local representatives and in the midterm elections. And people don't understand the power they have, but we see collectively just how powerful um, we are. And I'm happy. And I am, like I said, I'm proud of this generation. You all are proving me wrong. You all are useful and you all are speaking up for what you believe in. So I'm just, I'm very happy. And I am in the company of some amazing people. Well, Love y'all. I just want to thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that information with us. And I want to thank all three of you gentlemen for giving us your insight, um, being a part of this movement uh, and moving us forward as black people. And thank you once again for joining me on the show. Also, thank you to Nick and Josie. Um, we have to cut it short for today, but we all know this is a subject that's not going to be stopped talking about we're gonna to continue to put forth our action. Um, please don't forget to join us for part three of this conversation um, on Friday at 4 p.m. live on our Facebook. We have Araya Lester and Paul Thomas. Thank you so much for your time and tuning in. And until Friday, I will see you guys on Friday. <laughs>